Joining us to have this debate is a recognized authority on commodities, Stephen Lieb. He's the research chairman of the Lieb Group and author of the award-winning book, Red Alert, with his views on the sector. Thanks for joining us tonight. Pleasure, Karina. So we're having this debate. <laughs> we've got Citigroup that's saying, okay, the party is over, whereas Goldman is saying, you know, we're going to continue on with this rush. You are bullish on um, commodities. Why? Well, I mean, big picture, Karina. Take oil, for example. Take Brent oil. This year, it's likely to average very close to an all-time high. And that is coming in the context of the developed world showing no growth whatsoever over the past five years. Clearly, I mean, if there's any evidence you need that supplies are tight, that's it. Typically, when the United States, Europe, and Japan don't grow, commodity prices drop drastically. Mm -hmm. You've seen maybe on average about a 1% drop. And in some cases, like food, you've actually seen prices go up. I mean, this is big picture. Supplies are scarce. And that's what's going to continue to drive that. Plus, huge demand coming from China. I, I, I don't think people realize just how much, how much more commodities China is going to need before they finish their work. It is a huge sum. Okay, but to play devil's advocate, Stephen, sure. I mean, we've been hearing from pretty much everyone that they expect growth in the emerging economies to slow, not dramatically, but I mean, slow, to, not from the 10% level that we've seen over the past decade um, or several decades. So if we do see slower growth in China and in India and places that have been driving these prices higher, isn't that going to cause the prices to fall? Well, it depends how it slows and my guess is no it won't I mean if you just take a you know again big picture snapshot China's plans over the next let's say till 2020 call for this the urbanization of some 300 million people that's the United States that's unfathomable amounts of copper lead zinc silver you name it now their plans also call and this is on no one's real radar screen but China plans to spend probably in the neighborhood of two trillion with a T dollars <laughs> on developing a new energy infrastructure. This economy gets it. They realize that hydrocarbons, whether it be uh, uh, oil, natural gas, etc., are not going to last indefinitely. And they plan by 2020 to have at least 20 percent of their economy running on renewables. And that is going to mean massive amounts of copper, massive amounts of silver for solar, photovoltaic, you name it. But to spend that kind of money, that's a warlike effort, is going to require commodities that, you know, it's just tremendous. Okay, so you're talking about the metals. I uh, want to get into gold. We've seen, you know, uh, very loose monetary policy around the world, and that likely will continue from all indications. How is that going to impact gold prices? I think gold prices, you know, I don't want to sound like a nut. So if I tell you where I think gold and silver will end up, you'll never have me back. But suffice it to say, I think they're going dramatically higher, Karina. And here's the bottom line. I think a lot of commodities are going to get ever scarce. I mean, you see it just in the copper space. Even Chile, for example, which has the largest copper reserves in the world, they're having trouble getting the reserves out of the ground because they don't have electri enough electricity, enough water. Commodities are running scarce, and if that's the case, people are not going to trade their scarce commodities for money that you can just create off the printing press. They are going to want some other thing that's valuable and hard in exchange, and that's going to be gold. Okay, so from an investment standpoint, uh, has the market factored what you believe in yet, or do you think there's still more room to grow? And if so, how should an investor get best get access to the metals? Is well, it through ETFs or buying right. the actual I mean, if I had to bars. name one bull market that I feel very confident in, it would be junior golds. That's really the only marginal supply of gold in the world, the only meaningful marginal supply of gold in the world is in the hands of a handful or maybe a dozen junior gold companies. And there's an ETF in this country, GD, GDXJ, which is a collection of junior golds. In the late 1970s, early 80s, junior golds went up 10, 20 fold. I think this time around, it could even be greater. And a bull market like that will hide a lot of investment since. All right, I'll write that ticker down later. Uh, about silver, though, where do you see prices going? Oh, 
Karina, I mean, silver's <laughs> got not only the, 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 the uh, monetary aspect to it, I mean, it's an old, according to Milton Friedman, it was the first monetary metal, but it's vital in everything we're doing. There's so much silver around us in this room as we talk on all these electronic devices, but the key thing is it's needed for photovoltaics. And that is going to be a market that probably will dwarf everything else. And I think silver, you know, I don't want to, well, I'll sound a little bit crazy because I did say <laughs> oil was going to go to 100 when it was uh -huh. at 30. Silver is now in the 30s. I think 100 over the next two to three years uh, is easily doable. Okay. Easily doable. You are a raging bull, Stephen. Thank you so much <laughs> Thanks, for Karina. joining us tonight. Uh, that was Stephen Lieb, Research Chairman of the Lieb Group.